Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about the reactions of Grignard reagents with protic compounds. Uh, in addition to being nucleophiles, which is the, the sort of more synthetically useful application of Grignard reagents, Grignard reagents are really strong bases. Uh, and this can complicate their use in, in reactions, and we'll talk about those uh, complications here in a moment. Um, so just again, I'm, I'm going to show, write out a generic, you know what, no, I'm going to write out a specific Grignard reagent, so bear, bear, bear with me. I want to just use the simplest of all possible Grignard reagents, like methyl magnesium chloride. Right. Uh, this reaction, or I'm sorry, this reagent, uh, while there is a carbon-magnesium bond and it's polarized towards carbon, there's a fairly large electronegativity difference there. And some people would like us to think that a, a Grignard reagent is a little bit like thinking about a carbanion and the, the magnesium chloride cation. Now, again, this particular this particular you know, sort of way of thinking is not necessarily super representative of the actual structure. These are covalent molecules. Uh, they, they they're not pairs of ions, but you know the Grignard reagent does act like a carbanion equivalent. But just like in the hydride transfer just like in the hydride transfer reduction, you know, the hydride transfer reagents aren't hydride anions themselves, but they deliver hydride anions. And so Grignard reagents sometimes can be thought of acting like a carbanion equivalent. And then the reason that I happen to choose methane is because I know the PK or I know the, the estimated pKa of methane, not chlorine. Carbon. Carbon. How are you doing, Jessica? Looking for me? Yeah. The, the, the pKa of methane is, is approximately like 50 for, for alkanes and, and other simple hydrocarbons. So this is a really basic thing. This or this carbanion would be a really basic thing if it existed. And, and so Grignard reagents are very strong bases. Uh, and most importantly, that has them, you know, reacting with protic compounds. And it's important, so it's important to remember, well, what are the, the protic compounds? Uh, basically, number one, anything that's an acid, right? So we're talking about all of your, your mineral acids from Gen Chem, like HCl, nitric acid, doesn't have to be a strong acid, phosphoric acid. Um, Anything that's an acid. Um, they react with carboxylic acids. They react with uh, water. They react with alcohols. They react with the NH bond in certain amides terminal alkynes. Uh, and so you'll notice that this uh, list of protic compounds has extended beyond the traditional definition of protic that we use in understanding some kinds of protic behavior to things that don't even hydrogen bond, but are still relatively acidic compared to, to the hydrocarbons. Uh, it's, this is an important thing to remember in the behavior of Grignard reagents is because these acid base reactions are fast and they're unavoidable. 
And so if you are trying to do a Grignard reagent in the present or Grignard reaction in the presence of one of these incompatible things, the acid base reaction is going to take over. So if you happen to have, for example, uh, isopropyl magnesium chloride, and you were looking to do a Grignard reaction with, um, oh, I don't know. Vanillin. Well, vanillin has a, an aldehyde group that can be an electrophile, but it also has the alkoxy group that does the acid base reaction. And so instead of getting the nucleophilic addition that you would like, you're going to get uh, a proton transfer that you'd rather not have. And so this reaction generates uh, the conjugate acid of the Grignard reagent, which is just the hydrocarbon, and the conjugate base over here uh, as its you know, chloromagnesium salt. Oh, we'll go OMGCL. And you probably don't want this to happen. Um, so you either need to avoid the protic things in the structures of your electrophiles, or there's this thing out there called protecting groups, so you could protect that and avoid the reaction. Um, or you just have to rethink what you're doing. Maybe this functional group can come in later in the synthesis uh, or so on. However, there are a couple of legitimate applications of this reaction that, that some people have developed. And so one of them is for isotope labeling, which is, is a really cool uh, thing in organic chemistry, uh, if you can replace carbon or hydrogen or other atoms with uh, their uncommon isotopes, it makes it easier to track those positions on the molecule by NMR spectroscopy, by mass spectrometry. Uh, and so there are some folks who might want to, say, have a an alkene and they want to do a reaction on that alkene and kind of track what happens. And so they'd like to know some things about this position Well, uh -oh. if you have that chloride, you could react it with magnesium to get the Grignard reagent. And that would happen because it's a radical reaction that would happen without messing with the stereochemistry here. Uh, and then if re you reacted that, with, instead of with just regular water, but deuterated water, where D or deuterium is the heavier isotope of hydrogen, this is a, a legitimate strategy for placing a deuterium label into a specific place. Uh, and because deuterium has an extra neutron, it's more massive than, than H, and it behaves differently in NMR spectroscopy. So you can track this all over the, the, the whatever you're going to do to it. Uh, the other legitimate use for this is the synthesis of alkynal Grignard reagents. Um, the having a halogen out here at the end of a terminal alkyne is something that's not uh, very common and tricky to synthesize. Uh, and so maybe what you would want to do instead is to uh, react that terminal hydrogen, uh, deprotonate it using another Grignard reagent, knowing that you're going to generate uh, the acetylenol or alkynol Grignard reagent uh, as the other outcome. And in this case, you know, the, the isopropyl group just becomes sacrificial. Another really important consequence of this reaction with protic molecules is the choice of solvent. And there's actually a lot that can be said um, about 
solve a choice in green or green agents. But basically, you are looking, you want to look for a polar, what, what we would call a coordinating solvent. So, so, so something that is a, a Lewis base uh, that has a pair of electrons that can coordinate the Grignard reagents. It turns out that outside of a coordinating situation, they tend to aggregate and bad things happen. Uh, but it needs to be a protic and not an electrophile. So what turns out to be true of a lot of the protic solvent or the aprotic, polar aprotic solvents you learn about uh, when talking about substitution reactions are also electrophiles. So they're not appropriate solvent choices uh, for Grignard reactions. And really honestly, the only functional group that meets the bill here are ethers. And common ether solvents that you see for Grignard reagents include things like diethyl ether, Methyl terpbutyl ether, which is a uh, less hazardous variation on on diethyl ether, it, it's got a higher boiling point and it's less flammable, uh, and less likely to form uh, explosive peroxides, which I think is pretty good. Or tetrahydrofuran, which is a, a cyclic ether. Um, all these molecules have the, the lone pairs on the oxygen, so they can coordinate to the Grignard reagents. Um, and they're not protic, and they're sort of polar, um, and so they can do the job. In the next video, we'll talk about the scope of the nucleophilic addition uh, variations of the Grignard reagent. And then uh, in the final video in the seri series, we'll talk about reactions or using the Grignard reagent purposefully to synthesize molecules with new carbon-carbon bonds. Thank you for watching.